This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. The simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Her message is committed to hands I cannot see. For love of her, sweet countrymen, judge tenderly of me. Το ταλέντο της Έμιλι Ντίκινσον δεν αναγνωρίστηκε στην εποχή του. Γεννημένη το 1830 στη σύντομη ζωή της η ποιήτρια έμεινε στην αφάνεια αφού μόλις πέντε ποίηματά της είχαν δημοσιευτεί εκ των οποίων τα περισσότερα με ψευδόνυμο. Την αποκαλούσαν λευκή γυναίκα γιατί στις ελάχιστες δημόσιες εμφανίσεις της φορούσε ρούχα σε άσπρο χρώμα ενώ ακόμα και μέσα στο σπίτι της κυκλοφορούσε με λουλούδια που έσβηναν την κακοσμία του σώματός της. Η καρδιά της ήθελε να ερωτευτεί. Η απομονωμένη και η διάζουσα προσωπικότητά της ζήτουσε ποιήση. Mm. Σε αυτή τη μάχη δεν υπήρχαν νικητές και ιτημένοι. You think you might smile, Mr. Dickinson? I am smiling. Πρώτα η καρδιά ζητάει δονή και ύστερα από τον πόνο την άδεια και παυσίπονα που τα μαρτύρια διώχνουν. Ασυμβίβαστη με τους ποιητικούς κανόνες της εποχής της, κατάφερε με το τολμηρό στυλ της να ορίσει νέα πορεία στην Αμερικανική ποιήση και έτσι έγινε η σημαντικότερη πρόδρομος του μοντερνισμού. Όλη η φιλοσοφία της ζωής της αναδύεται μέσα από τους στίχους της. Μια ψαλιδιά ένιωσα στο νου σαν να έχει χωριστεί. Έπιασα να το ράψω, μα δεν τέριαζε η κλωστή. Επηρεάστηκε από τους Βίλιαμ Μπλέικ, Ραλφ Βάλντο Έμερσον και Βίλιαμ Ωρσβόρθ και δεν έκρυψε στιγμή το θαυμασμό της για τους Τζον Κίτς και Ρόμπερτ και Ελίζαμπεθ Μπάρετ Μπράουνινγκ. Έως τα 35 της χρόνια είχε γράψει περισσότερα από 1100 ποίηματα που εξερευνούσαν την απώλεια, τη θλίψη, τη χαρά, τον έρωτα, την τέχνη και τη φύση. Βυθισμένη στη θλίψη, το πένθος και την απώλεια μετά από το χαμό του πατέρα και της μητέρας της, καθώς και αγαπημένων της προσώπων, έφυγε από τη ζωή στις 15 Μαΐου το 1886 σε ηλικία 56 ετών. Πέθανε η ζωή μου δύο φορές. Μένει λοιπόν να δω αν έχει αθανασία και ένα τρίτο μυστικό, τόσο πελώριο όσο αυτά, με τόση απελπισία. Παράδεισος η κόλαση είναι μόνο η απουσία. Do you believe that your creator is indifferent to your sins? That in his mercy he sees you slumber? No, you misunderstand me. I have not got so far. I am not even awakened yet. And how should I repent? I am somewhat troubled, to be sure, but my feelings are all indefinite. The question is not how far you have advanced, but how far you ought to have advanced. Not how you feel, but how you ought to feel. I don't feel anything. Ποια είναι η Emily Dickinson που μεταμόρφωσε την πεσημιστική αντίληψη του θανάτου σε τέχνη; I'm aware that Dickinson, even up to now, may seem a little bit gloomy, but the point is that death is an extremely vital topic. You, you could write about birth. And about food and pleasure and sex in a way to put people to sleep. It's dull. And you could write about death in a way that's exciting and exhilarating. And I think she does. I think that her dark vision uh, is a vision that is not gloomy. It's a vision that changes the way we think about things. It's exciting. Uh, it's uh, inspiriting. It, uh, it, it challenges it, the way we think. It collides ideas that we've got. Uh, death, of course, is a phenomenon that is really central uh, in women's lives in the late 19th century. Um, I say that because death is not something that is all that public in today's culture, although heaven knows uh, it's just as present as it ever has been. But in a culture of nursing homes and terminal care arrangements, we keep the dying out of sight for the most part. Uh, That's a whole separate topic, actually. But they weren't kept out of sight in the 19th century. 
Uh, and women in particular, it was part of women's work to tend to the dying. And they were, one tended to them, one kept them, one uh, ministered to them. Uh, I think that it was just a conspicuous piece of life. And that's one reason we can find it in Dickinson's work. We don't find it in the work of the transcendentalists. And Emerson is all about promise. Emerson is about people being part of the oversoul of the nothing but continuing life. Thoreau closes Walden with the famous reference to dawn. Uh, Thoreau talks about waking up people. Uh, Dickinson and Whitten, for that matter, are very much drawn to the phenomenon of death. But Dickinson's approaches and tones are different from Whitman's, totally different, and different from anybody else's that I've ever seen. I reckon when I count out all. First poets, then the sun, then summer, then the heaven of God, and then the list is done. But looking back, the first so seems to comprehend the whole, the others look a needless show, so I write poets all. Their summer lasts a solid year. They can afford a sun the East would deem extravagant. And if the further heaven be beautiful as they prepare for those who worship them, it is too difficult a grace to justify the dream. de la sección Zabaltequita Bacalera tendremos la ocasión a continuación de ver la película El Quiet Passion el último y más reciente trabajo del director británico Terence Davis y... And I've been very, very blessed in having two producers and this wonderful woman Well, it's about a 19th century American poet called Emily Dickinson, who lived from 1830 to 1886 and never found fame in her lifetime. It's about her. When you love something, um, you just want to do it. Uh, or, or if you love something, you don't necessarily want to make it, but you happen to love it. But I just feel passionate about what I do. If I didn't feel passionate about it, I can't do it. I just can't. I don't see anything. Um, I just think the story is, uh, story is extraordinary, but I do love the poems, you know, I really do love the poems. I mean, it's a really a formidable role, and then I was, love Emily Dickinson, and I have since I was a child, and I've always felt a tremendous simpatico with her, so on the one hand, I knew right away it was something that I wanted to do, and to work with Terence, but it was, it was daunting nonetheless, she's such a giant. Um, so to try and convince peop the audience and to try and convince myself that these poems might have come from me was, was the first challenge. feels the story so strongly, but also because he's such a fan of actors, you know. He's very encouraging in that way. So that's what, you know, that's what you want. You want that sort of warmth and sunlight, right, to help you open up so that things seem possible and not scary and, you know what I mean, so you can be brave and try things that maybe are terrible, you know. Um, and that's thrilling to watch. Yes, It's yes, thrilling to yeah. watch. But when you make it, you don't see that. I mean, you just want to try and be true to the material, that's all. That's what you've got to be true to. Um, any other 
extrapolation of meaning has to come from the audience. It can't come from me. Um, because you're too close to it. You're just too close to it. You know, and I can run the film in my head, particularly the scenes I like, which I think they, they perform really well. Those give me a lot of delight. But you, you can't know. I can't see it with fresh eyes. Oh, life! Oh, home! How wonderful you are! Emily, why are you up so late? May I speak with you, Father? Of course. As you may know, I like to write. Letters, mostly. But sometimes poetry. Yes. May I have your permission to write during the night, for quiet's sake? I shall not disrupt the rest of the household. I promise. Yes, you may. It's only my version of, of Emily. It's not anybody else's, you know. Um, and that's all I can say. It, it, it comes from knowing what that's like to be in a large family and just the love that, that, that there is there, you know. Um, that is so powerful. And there is a great deal of love in that family. The heart asks pleasure first and then excuse from pain, and then those little anodynes that deaden suffering, and then to go to sleep, and then, if it should be the will of its inquisitor, the liberty to die. Ο Τέρενς Ντέιβις είναι ένας βαθύτατα συναισθηματικός σκηνοθέτης με αγάπη στη λογοτεχνία, το θέατρο, τα ανθρώπινα πάθη και λάθη. Γεννήθηκε στις 10 Νοεμβρίου το 1945 σε ένα δυσλειτουργικό περιβάλλον για την καλλιτεχνική του ψυχή στο Λίβερπουλ. Ο βίος χαρακτήρας του πατέρα του και οι έντονες αναμνήσεις που είχε μέσα στο οικογενειακό περιβάλλον τον επηρέασαν αρκετά και πάνω σε αυτές βασίστηκαν οι πρώτες δουλειές του. Τα θέματα που τον αφορούν σχεδόν πάντα είναι η συναισθηματική αντοχή, η επιρροή της μνήμης στην καθημερινότητα και οι επιπτώσεις της δογματικής θρησκευτικότητας στη συναισθηματική ζωή του ατόμου και της κοινωνίας. Οι πιο γνωστές ταινίες του είναι «Η Μεγάλη Μέρα Τελειώνει», «Βίβλος από νέων», «Το Τίμημα της Αγάπης», «Ένα τραγούδι για το ηλιοβασίλεμα» αλλά και το βαθύ μπλε του έρωτα. Let's not be anything today except superficial. Yes. And superficiality should always be spontaneous. If it is studied, it is too close to hypocrisy. We may be superficial, but we aren't stupid. Heaven forbid. I've always been rather taken aback that the films, my films weren't abroad at all, because I thought they are about, you know, Britain and my own personal life. And I never thought anybody would think them interesting abroad so it's always it's always a lovely shock mm -hmm. but I think well what do they see in them what do they see in them? They, we see the inner poetry and we thank you so much for that I understand from Vinnie that you are a poet I write verses yes and what of your contemporaries mr. Longfellow for instance his genius lies in stating the obvious oh that is too harsh there are many fine things in Hiawatha. I'm sorry I was cruel, but, madam, I must say in truth, Hiawatha is but cruel. Read just one stanza for the proof. No. Give me something pressed from truth. And that is poetry. I can understand why Emily Dickinson, because, as I told you, poetry is always in your movies. But what uh, was the narrative hook for you starting working in this project? Well, two, really. Um, one, she was... Uh, she used to get very homesick. Um, she was ill with homesick. And she went to this local seminary, which was only ten miles away. But when you travel by coach, it's a long way. She was only 17 and they had to take her out because she was so, so homesick. And when I was a child I had to go away uh, because I had a chest infection. And I only went away for a month to North Wales, which is not that far from Liverpool. But that month I yearned every night to go home. I just yearned every night. And I, I knew what that feels like. 
Um, also, I knew what it felt like that having a family I, I'm from a large family that was very close, and I never wanted it to change. I wanted it to be like that forever. And she was the same. But the biggest, the biggest draw was her spiritual dilemma. Is there a God? Is there not? I have no sense of my sins, and how can I? I wish I could feel as others do, but it is not possible. A sinner against a holy God and under condemnation and liable every moment to drop into a burning, hopeless eternity, yet cannot feel, cannot be alarmed, cannot flee from the wrath to come. The true question is, are you in the Ark of Safety? I fear I am not. You are alone in your rebellion, Miss Dickinson. If we have this thing called a soul and there is no God, what do we do? And I was brought up a Catholic and I was a very devout Catholic um, until the last seven years of my practicing of 15 to 22. And because you're told as a Catholic, if you doubt, it's the devil's work. I really did, f I really fought hard against doubt until I realized that it was just a lie. And that left a huge hole in me, because I, I believed, I really did believe with my whole heart and soul that it was true. Um, and I, so I understood her religious dilemma. But the other thing um, that moved me more than anything else is the fact that she wasn't recognized in her lifetime. That really does upset me. And it's, it's exactly the reason why I love Bruckner. Um, he was not celebrated in his own time. And these his, his symphonies are some of the greatest music ever written. And what she did, some, some of the greatest poetry ever written. And I do feel very much for that. Um, even in little things, I mean, her bread only won second prize. I mean, why couldn't she have won first prize just once? <laughs> Will you go with us to church, Miss Buffum? Of course not. Going to church is like going to Boston. You only enjoy it after you've gotten home. We are to pray for the repose of our late pastor's soul. Doesn't that rather depend on where it's gone? <laughs> we shall become fast friends. Of course we shall. I'm irresistible. Everyone says so. I, I think I agree with um, her friend, Miss Buffum, <laughs> that um, heaven will be really, really boring. And hell will be even more boring than that. <laughs> when the new pastor does arrive, you must point him out to me. So that you too may be saved. No. So that I will know whom to avoid. Είναι αξιοπορίας πως η προσωπικότητα της Emily Dickinson δεν είχε απασχολήσει ποτέ τον κινηματογράφο στο παρελθόν μέσα από μια ολοκληρωμένη ταινία μυθοπλασίας. Αυτός ήταν ο βασικός λόγος που οι παραγωγοί αφιέρωσαν αρκετά χρόνια από τη ζωή τους στο στάδιο της προπαραγωγής αυτής της ταινίας. This plate is dirty. It is dirty no longer. We're a producing partnership we're Liverpool, we're Liverpool based and um, my father is Greek Cypriot my mother was Irish and I'm um, second generation uh, Greek Cypriot and proud to be so Emily as usual dramatizes I live a very quiet life no one would know I was here but if you weren't oh what a chasm you would leave Three, three films we've done with Terence. Your soul is no trivial matter. I agree, Father. That's why I'm so meticulous in guarding its independence. We're based in Liverpool. Uh, we met, first worked with Terence um, eight years ago. Uh, he hadn't worked for a number of years, and his comeback film was Hot Time in the City which was an absolute honor to work on. It was you know, a, a, great, a great experience. And since subsequently we've made two films with Terence, Sunset Song and A Quiet Passion, and it's been an honor to make those three films and we're very proud of them. They all go. They all leave. They all desert you. Do not touch me! I will not be pitied. It makes me feel repulsive. You set too much store by physical beauty, Emily. 
the only people who can be sanguine about not being handsome are those who are beautiful already. The rest of us have only our envy to keep us warm. You have an exquisite nature. What's the use of that in this world? I sometimes think you are too harsh with yourself. I have many defects. There is much to rectify. It was a challenge from the very start to make this film, and I suppose a surprise to us that no one had made a film about Emily Dickinson before, because she is America's greatest female poet, without doubt. And, you know, we were introduced to her world and her, her words by Terence Davis. And once we started reading her, we were consumed by the work and, the, and the, the, just the depth of it. And its, it's, it's power is just unique and, and special. And she was a woman ahead of her time. So finding, the challenge to raise finance for a film like that is enormous because every, the only things people knew about Emily Dickinson was that she was reclusive and she was obsessed with mortality and death. So it doesn't make a natural kind of subject matter for a film, but then you give that subject matter to someone like Terence Davis and you get an experience of a quiet passion, which is incredibly funny, very sharp-witted, uh, has all the pathos of the language that she created, and yet then takes you on the journey of tragedy that was her life. Shall I close the door? No. Leave it open. It's lovely to hear the music. Developing a film like this takes um, patience and determination. Um, we had to be very patient because it took four years to raise the money. We we'd, we'd cast Cynthia um, four years earlier, so she was very patient. She stayed with the, with the film. And then the determination to raise the money, the first significant finance we found was in the UK and it was that money that made the film. We subsequently got more money from Belgium because we were a Belgian co-production but most of the money was European and most of the film was shot in Europe although we shot some scenes in in the grounds of Emily Dickinson's house in Massachusetts. Emily, make sure your bread is ready for the agricultural fair tomorrow. Yes, I haven't forgotten. They feel swollen. They are swollen. Like my feet. <gasps> oh! Cynthia Nixon, um, one, wonderfully for us, and we didn't know this at the time, when we approached her with the script, uh, Terence had thought about her when he was writing the script, and he'd thought about her because he'd met her in an audition previously. So when he wrote the script, her, her, um, her performance was in mind, and that's who he wanted from the beginning. So when we made the approach to Cynthia Nixon, we didn't realise at the time, but she actually grew up with Emily Dickinson. Her mother used to play records of Claire Bloom reading Emily Dickinson's words. So you can imagine in New York, Cynthia Nixon getting a script about Emily Dickinson, who she's consumed by anyway, and suddenly she reads this wonderful script which brings Emily Dickinson's life to, to, to life, and she was on board straight away. It was fantastic. And she stuck with us, as, as Roy said, for four years till we got the final finance together. For each ecstatic instant, we must an anguish pay in keen and quivering ratio to the ecstasy. For each beloved hour, sharp pittances of years, bitter contested farthings, and coffers heaped with tears. Η κοκκινομάλα δικηγόρο του Sex and the City, κατά κόσμον Σύνθια Νίξον, δεν είναι μόνο η Μιράντα Χόουπς που αγάπησαν σχεδόν όλες οι γυναίκες μέσα από τη δημοφιλή σειρά. Με πέντε υποψηφιότητες για χρυσή σφαίρα, τέσσερις εκ των οποίων για το ρόλο της στη σειρά που προαναφέραμε και δύο φορές τιμημένη με Έμι, δείχνει αποφασισμένη να επαναπροσδιορίσει την εικόνα της στο ευρύ κοινό. Ίσως η πιο επιτυχημένη της προσπάθεια είναι αυτή η συντενία ήρεμο πάθος που υποδίεται την αγαπημένη της ποιήτρια Έμιλι Ντίκινσον. Εκτός από τις κινηματογραφικές συμμετοχές της στο Sex and the City, συμμετείχε μεταξύ άλλων και στις δημοφιλείς ταινίες Amadeus, The Pelican Brief, Οικογένεια Adams 2, Σταγόνες Αγάπης.
One of the problems that uh, Emily Dickinson had, it, it was that uh, she wasn't sure if heaven existed, if hell existed, if religion had a power. So I would like your thoughts about religion. Do you believe that by bringing uh, uh, this kind of connection in our life, uh, we bring light to our life, we bring darkness in our life, it's something that exists, that it doesn't exist? I think that, you know, people say, and I believe it, that people who have a firm belief in religion are generally happier and more hopeful and often kinder people. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure about, you know, organized religion. If you do this, you'll go to heaven. If you do this, you'll go to hell. That seems kind of preposterous to me. Um, but I do, I do hope there is something like a God, and I do hope there is something after we die. I, you know, I'm skeptical, like Emily was, but I think it's a big question. And I think, you know, Emily had to really wrestle with religion because she came from such a religious society. And maybe for many of us, we don't, that's less a factor for us, but we still have to wrestle with death and eternity and what that is. The dying need but little, dear. A glass of water's all. A flower's unobtrusive face to punctuate the wall. A fan, perhaps, a friend's regret, and certainly that one no color in the rainbow perceives when you are gone. Look back on time with kindly eyes. He doubtless did his best. How softly sinks his trembling sun in human nature's west. I would like also to ask you your personal thoughts about uh, the, if you have a fear of death and dying. I have a terrible fear of death and dying, and I have since I was a child. And I think that, it, you know, most of the time, most of us just mm. pretend that it doesn't exist because it's so hard to go through life and keep your eye on the, knowing that this will be the end. Mm. But I think that is one of the things that allowed Emily Dickinson to be so alive, mm. is that she never, she never kidded herself about death, and mm. she looked... She looked at it squarely in the eye for the whole time that she was living, and I think um, it overwhelmed her at times, but I think also it made her enjoyment of, of this world here and the sensations and the pleasures of this world here much more intense and acute. Of so divine a loss, we enter but the gain. Indemnity for loneliness, that such a bliss has been. You're a woman with quite lack of vanity. Uh, you shaved your head for a, th a fantastic theatrical yes, play, yes. Wit. How are you feeling today? Great. That's just great. Because after Sex and the City, you've been categorized in some specific parts, and you said, okay, yes. I need to be something more because I am something more. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm very lucky that Sex and the City happened sort of in the middle of my life when it did, because, uh, you know, people never thought of me that way as a sexy woman, as a fashion icon, you know, whatever. It's helpful when you show people that you can do those things and be those things, even if it's not necessarily who you are. Um, and so now it's, it's um, you know, we used to say that being in Sex and the City was like fashion boot camp. <laughs> Champagne? You are fun in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> you know, whatever. You have that muscle, you develop it, and then you could, you know, go on to other muscles, but at least, you know, it's it's there in your body. This is my sister, Lavinia. But everyone calls me Vinny. And this is my other sister, Emily. And everyone calls me Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> Emily is pulling the leg of somebody in the film by saying that her name is Napoleon. So what's your nickname? <laughs> oh, I don't know what my nickname is. For right now, it's Emily. Okay. <laughs> well, come down, damn you. I refuse to speak to someone who's a flight of stairs above me. Forgive me, sir, if I'm frightened. I never see anyone, and I hardly know what to say. 
You could say thank you for my publishing some of your verse. For that, sir, you have more than my thanks. You have my gratitude, but... Sir, you have altered some of my punctuation. Good Lord. What's a hyphen here or a semicolon there? To many, nothing. But to me, the alteration of my punctuation marks is very hard to endure. Then I apologize. I was merely trying to make your meaning clearer to my readers. Clarity is one thing, sir. Obviousness, quite another. The only person qualified to interfere with the poet's work is the poet herself. You try to make people understand the importance of talking openly about their life. How important is it for you being this kind of uh, uh, person which ex wants to express herself uh, and uh, also try to inspire people around her? Yes, I think that I, I think that um, the more that people can be forthcoming about their experience, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's good because I think there are so many different kinds of people in the world, and a lot of the a lot of time, people that we think we don't like or we don't like that kind of person, mm -hmm. it's just because we don't understand them, and if they would try and explain themselves to us, we might still not approve of them, but at least we would understand where they're coming from. Send him where you want to whoever you want. But don't tell him that he's failing. Like I just played Nancy Reagan and there are things, many things about Nancy Reagan that I don't like. But having learned so much about her and, you know, doing research on her, I now have, I now at least understand why she was the way she was to some degree mm -hmm. and I can now uh, empathize with her if not wholly <laughs> applaud her at least I, I, I feel like I understand why she made the decision she made and you Miss Dickinson what of you what of me sir will you not kneel and give yourself to God no sir I will not kneel though I think that God has already given himself to me that was profane. It was not meant so, sir. Do you guard your soul, Emily? As best as I am able, sir. And hell? What of hell? Avoid it if I can. Endure it if I must. Oh, what a call is this. The dear ones, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, cry, come, come. And the church below, Christ's witness unto the world and the church above, with the rustling of the white robes and the sweeping of the golden harps, cries, come, come. And the angels of heaven, lo, rank above rank, immortal principalities, as they circle the eternal throne, they have caught up the sound and cry, come.